what every Adventist scientist should know, the origin of the universe. We're doing a series on what every sci Adventist scientist should know. Our first uh, talk was on general the philosophy of science. We're now uh, um, looking at the question of is there a God? Does science rule out God? And we're going to be talking about the origin of the universe this week, the privileged planet next week, the origin of life the week after that if things go as planned, the task of unguided evolution eventually and genetic entropy. In addition, we have already covered how old is life on Earth, and the only thing we're missing now is paleocurrence, which we hope, if things work out well, to have our Chadwick uh, give us a talk on. Um, then eventually we'll be talking about uh, challenges to young life creationism, um, specifically the Coconino Sandstone, the Yellowstone Fossil Forest, examples of previous challenges, which are not now not so much challenges, and then two of the more um, challenging ones today, which is ice cores and radiometric dating, and then eventually we'll uh, get to Ellen White's health messages. Um, we're not talking about all of Ellen White uh, because that's not the science religion interface, but we will be talking about uh, uh, the general health message and uh, also specifically alcohol, which is under challenge now. And I think that uh, these are areas where Adventist scientists should be aware of uh, the facts, the theories, the questions that are out there. Um, our talk today is on the origin of the universe, and of course, um, that's usually uh, nowadays thought to be the Big Bang, so we will start there. Now, I need to tell you up front, I'm not assuming that science, as in the current scientific consensus, is correct in this. Um, modern science is often constructed using methodological naturalism, which ignores the possibility of divine intervention or control. We've seen that in some of our previous uh, talks, and um, so I don't think we can just take science over straight without examining it. But one of the things that I will do is simply point out the concepts involved, where those concepts lead when facts are brought to bear. And uh, that means that for the final conclusion, you're going to have to think for yourself. Of course, um, there are some who believe that the uh, uh, job of education is to have people who think for themselves and are not uh, mere reflectors of other people's thoughts. So <clears throat> we're going to start by assuming methodological naturalism, even though that is not uh, something that I would consider a safe assumption it is the most generous assumption that we can make uh, towards those who do not wish to see the hand of God in nature. The first assumption would be that matter and energy always has a cause, a material cause, which means that you can trace it back through eternity. Now, that assumption can be combined with an observation that galaxies have, in general, a redshift to their spectrums, and furthermore, the further away they are, the more the redshift. And the suggestion was that, that the most obvious interpretation of that is that they are moving away from us. Now, for the, some of you, I might have to explain what a redshift is, um, it means that the light that is coming from a star, instead of being a shorter wavelength or the normal wavelength, will have wavelengths that are progressively getting longer and therefore in the visible light that shifts you towards the red end of the spectrum rather than the violet end of the spectrum. Um, 
And how do you know that the star isn't just simply hot or, or less hot and therefore having a red shift because it's cooler? Well, the major way that you can tell is that there are specific spectral lines that come from various elements that have been heated well enough. Um, usually in a star there'll be dark lines where these elements are absorbing uh, light. And those lines will also be shifted to the red end of the spectrum. And how far they're shifted tells you uh, how far the rest of the light has been shifted as well. Um, and this uh, can be analogous, although not completely, um, to the idea that if you're driving an automobile and a uh, policeman shoots a radar beam at you and it comes back, um, that the beam will be slightly elongated by the speed at which you're going away from the policeman. And uh, if it's, uh, the shift is not too great, then you're not going too fast. And if the shift is great enough, then you are going too fast and uh, he's likely to pull you over and give you a ticket. Uh, the first assumption, therefore, was that the universe is expanding. Expanding relatively evenly. Now, if you run time backwards, that means that previously the universe was more contracted than it is now. And if you extrapolate that all the way back to the beginning, you either have the universe coming together and doing a near miss and then expanding out into the uh, past further, or it comes to a point. Stephen Hawking and others, and if I recall correctly, um, uh, Roger Penrose is one of those, but it doesn't matter, argued and successfully that a near miss was mathematically ruled out for the universe and that therefore it all went back to a single point. And that's pretty well accepted. If you accept the expanding universe, you are stuck with a confluence at the origin where everything packs into an infinitely small space. Thus, if you insist that matter and energy last as long as possible within the present physical rules in the past, of course, it all goes back to a point. And at that point, the laws of physics break down because some measures will be you know, divided by space or perhaps even divided by time. And that goes to zero. And that means that the laws don't apply. It's called a singularity. And before that, there was no space or time. Yes? Was the uh, uh, near miss, you could near miss in two ways, spatially and temporally. So uh, was it mathematically proven both? Uh, if you prove one, you prove the other because space and time are interrelated. So uh, the thing is, uh, you know, I won't argue the point other than to say that this is the consensus of physicists who have looked at it and seconded by the most uh, probably one of the most, if not the, mo the smartest physicist of uh, uh, today, Stephen Hawking, who originated it. Yes. It's just interesting. I'm just really where it says where the laws in physics really are where it says it breaks down. If it breaks down, how does it come back together? Because it just really 
kind of blows my mind that all the matter in the universe came together at a singularity point and then came back as a full-fledged universe with stars and things of that nature from a bang when you have the strong force and the weak force and gravitational force and all of those different forces how do they come into play in what we have today? Well, it, by definition almost, it's a miracle. It is something that's totally out of the ordinary. Uh, so, uh, where the laws of physics break down, you can't say that they're violated because you can't predict what they would say. Um, now, of course, this has implications, as has been noted by many people, Robert Jastro, um, who commented in uh, God and the Astronomers uh, on page 116. Uh, Jastro is not a Christian, not even a believer in God in the strict sense. Um, although you wonder after reading him whether he doesn't think possibly there is a God, simply because he doesn't have much choice. As he put it on the, I think this is the final page of his, of his uh, book, for the scientist who's lived by his faith in the power of reason, that is reason without scripture, uh, you know, just thinking about things, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to scale the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. Um, Stephen Hawking struggled against this conclusion, and we'll find that he eventually rejected it. But uh, uh, he, he is quoted uh, uh, by John Bosler as saying, the odds against a universe like ours emerging out of something like the Big Bang are enormous. I think there are clearly religious implications whenever you start to discuss the origins of the universe. But I think most scientists prefer to shy away from the religious side of it. So the picture you are getting from the physicists is definitely not one uh, that's trying to put God into a spot where he doesn't belong. It's more like trying hard not to recognize God's existence and finding that there isn't much alternative. Reluctantly. Um, Hawking proposed a quantum rounding of the original point so that it wasn't actually a point since so time gradually moved into a space-like uh, uh, quality and then uh, uh, all of this is now com uh, sort of a, a giant sphere. Now, of course, you lose it if, it if the universe keeps on expanding forever, which is the way it looks like right now. Um, in fact, it looks like it's expanding with a vengeance right now. Uh, but, but this was the attempt. It was using imaginary time, which is time multiplied by I, which is the square root of minus one, which if you know your math, that doesn't normally exist, but uh, mathematicians say, but what if it was, did exist, then what kind of properties would it have? Well, the only property that you can really say is that I squared equals minus one. Uh, we have another comment back here. You said that the universe is expanding. Uh, is there current is this a current scientific fact, or is this just a theory? Well, the universe has galaxies in it that have red shifts. And the further away you go, the bigger the red shift. And the most straightforward interpretation, and the only one that they can think of, is that the universe is expanding. Beyond that, Einstein's general theory of relativity requires that the uni universe either be expanding or contracting, or perhaps right now is just at equipoise and will start to contract. 
And so yeah, uh, these are these are all <coughs> theories. It sounds that have not been measured in any way. So my question is, has it uh, has any sort of expansion been measured at all? And because I'm just thinking in terms of common sense, if the universe is expanding, then the Earth would have gone further away from the Sun, or Mars would have been further away from the Earth uh, at some you know, kind of uh, space, some, some amount of space, and has that been measured? So that's all I'm asking. Well, as a matter of fact, we're going to come back to that question. And that's one of the questions that we'll uh, eventually run into. Um, but if you accept the galaxies expanding away from each other, then you, even if you do the Hawking maneuver, you still have a beginning in real time. Now, there might be some dispute as to 10 to the minus 43 seconds as to when it happened. Um, but that there's a beginning in real time is still not disputed. And I'm not sure that Hawking solved the problem is the point that I'm making. Um, atheists resisted this conclusion, but then even supposed theists, interestingly enough, uh, Arthur Eddington, as far as I know, as far as I can tell, was a, an actual believer in God, but he, stead, he still said, philosophically, the notion of a beginning of the present order of nature is repugnant to me. I should like to find a genuine loophole. And you can find quotes by a number of people, including Albert Einstein, that tried desperately to avoid this idea. In fact, there's a whole different cosmology that was invented called the steady state uh, cosmology, which was proposed precisely to allow for an eternal universe. Uh, it took what is known as the Copernican principle. That's probably a misnomer because Copernicus actually elevated us to the status of stardust rather than making uh, things worse. Um, in the medieval conception, the worst things were in the center of the earth. The next worst things were on the surface of the earth. As you get out further, you get more and more perfect until you get to the sun, moon, and stars, which are absolutely perfect. They're made out of the fifth element, quintessence. Um, but one of the uh, kind of things that has been taken is that what Copernicus said was that, A, we're on the earth, we're not anything special because we go around the sun. B, the sun goes around the center of the galaxy. So what makes us think that our star is any particularly special? I mean, it's not the biggest star, it's not the smallest star. I don't know, somehow I think Goldilocks would disagree, but um, there is just right. Uh, but the principle is then we can't be in a special place in the universe. Yes. The reason I ask that question is because it seems that all of these theories, they have a semblance of truth to them. I'm not saying that they're true. Yeah. I'm saying they have a semblance of truth to them. Because say, for example, if, let's look at it from a, from a believing point of view. If God said, let there be, then I can understand that uh, something came out of nothing, or in, in this theory that you, you were just, you're sharing with us, something came out of an infinitely sp small point, which could which be... Which actually came out of nothing itself, not even time or space. Yeah, so I guess you see what I'm saying. So there seems to be a semblance of, a semblance of truth to the theory, but I'm not sure if I want to believe the theory to begin with, because <coughs> it says that if, it, if, if something came out of an infinitely small point and then it began to expand and the universe came into being and planets of s and galaxies of sizes we cannot even begin to talk about came out of an infinitely small point and is still expanding and there's no measurement of that expansion, then to me, you know, if there's no uh, 
way of proving the measurement of some sort of expansion, then the whole theory of something coming out of a small point is, doesn't really make any sense. Do you see what I'm saying? But yeah, I, I, I do. But the, 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 only, the only answer to that is that it looks like they're moving in a particular direction, and it is reasonable to say, since not only are they moving in that direction, but they're not like coming back and forth. In other words, the redshift stays pretty much the same for any particular galaxy, no matter when you measure it. Whether you measure it, let's say, in 19... Uh, uh, 1980, or whether you measure it right now, it's the, still the same redshift. So they presumably they're continuing to move outward. But think then about it's 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 reasonable to it's reasonable to take this as a first assumption. Now, afterwards, I'm going to criticize this. Uh, but uh, but what I'm what I'm doing right now is let's you know give the standard theorists all of the um, uh, the benefit of the doubt that we can oh. okay um, the argument for the steady state was that the universe is expanding that it looks the same everywhere and not only everywhere but every time and if you make that assu assumption that the universe just looks the same at all times, then of course, if the galaxies are continuing to expand away from each other, then you're going to have to create here and there new galaxies so that it keeps looking the same at all times. Um, so matter must be created periodically. Now, at this point, some of you are saying, well, why not uh, 6,000 years ago a certain... Um, medium-sized sun was created with its planets. And there's really, no, you know, once you start saying that matter appears periodically for no particular reason at all, uh, then there's really no reason to object to the creation of the Earth. But, of course, that's not what they wanted to do. And so what they did was they said, no, it can't be created that way. It must be created as hydrogen, so and, and evenly spaced throughout the universe. So a, you couldn't detect it, and b, God would never create an Earth and its accompanying star. I mean, you can see that these people are mm, working, hard. working hard to avoid a theist conclusion. But for most people, I, the Big Bang has won over the steady state theory, and for several reasons. Number one, the universe further away from us looks different from what it does up close. Uh, there are more quasars, for example, further out. The galaxies look slightly younger, although not as young as you'd expect. Uh, there is remnants of the original radiation. And by the way, in that particular one, a Nobel Prize, or several of them, I think, have been awarded for finding some of these things. And the abundance of hydrogen, helium, and lithium are about what one would expect from a Big Bang. And given all of that, most people will say the steady state just won't cut it, and we're looking at a Big Bang. Now, of course, that doesn't ask what caused the Big Bang. Whatever it is, it must be outside of time and space. Which means that although some people will say, well, it's just a quantum fluctuation, it's a little hard to make the case of that because quantum fluctuations happen within time and space. And, you know, it's awfully tempting to say there's a God who has his own time who did this. But, of course, that's getting too close to admitting to a god. And so the current theory is that it's multiple universes. Well, now, at this point, we're starting to get into some very interesting things. Uh, multiple universes does have one advantage from their point of view. That is that it can overcome astronomical odds. So if the origin of life is very, very unlikely, you just have 
gazillions of universes and one of them will eventually have life. You know, as long as the odds are finite, why well, you can multiply universes far enough to where you can overcome those odds. Um, there is a problem that there's no physical evidence for multiple universe. In fact, in a certain sense, there cannot be physical evidence for multiple universes because that's what the term universe means. Uh, but leaving aside the definition, uh, even if somehow we could figure out from the mathematics of our universe that there must be other universes out there, it's a totally, um, it's a totally unsupported theory other than, other than inferences, which we're not even sure whether they're correct or not. And so we have now left physics and gone to metaphysics, which means that all those uncomfortable metaphysical questions are going to have to be revisited. Um, furthermore, there's the question of what caused the multiple universes. In other words, all you've done is moved it one step back. Uh, and, you know, did the multiple universes begin? If, uh, what makes a, if you could call it that, a multiple universe generating machine so that you can get this stuff started? We don't really understand. And if the multiple universes appear to be designed so that they will be, uh, so that they will have random properties, uh, then it raises the question of uh, why should they have random properties? Why shouldn't they have properties that simply would make our personal universe not uh, valid? And well, why should it come out our way? Well, some people have attempted to say, well, they're actually not just multiple universes, but infinite universes. But that destroys the scientific defense against miracles. Because, you see, not only is the question of the origin of life a question that's on the uh, table, but also Jesus walking on the water. Um, if water molecules align themselves 50.01% going up instead of down, it will exert enough pressure on a foot so that the, the weight of the person will not push the foot into the water. The only thing that makes sure that most of us can't walk on water is that the second law of thermodynamics holds. And the second law is a statistical law, which means that if you have enough universes, sooner or later it will be violated. And that means that if we have reliable witnesses that say that somebody walked on water, we have no reason to question it from the scientific laws because, you know, in some universe it's bound to happen. And from the witnesses, ours must have been the universe. Well, that's not where they want to go either. Now, the Big Bang hypothesis contains several what I would call ad hoc solutions. That is to say, they're solutions that are meant to cure the problems in the theory and don't have other uh, observable consequences. For example, the universe is grossly smooth. That is to say, it's not really lumpy. It's just lumpy enough to form galaxies, but that's all. Well, that takes an incredibly smooth uh, expansion. And so one of the things that was proposed to try to help that is something called inflation, which means that the very earliest part of the universe didn't just expand at the speed of light or nearly the speed of light. It expanded at much faster. And uh, in fact, I'll show you a drawing in just a little bit. But why should it expand? 
we don't know of any universe expansion principle. And why should it stop expanding once it gets so big? It, that is what you'd call an ad hoc solution. It doesn't do any other work. Galaxies, especially the older galaxies, the ones that are, you know, um, that are supposed to be billions of years old, by now should have all of their stars kind of mi all mixed up and you shouldn't see any spiral arms because it should all be diffused into one elliptical galaxy. We do have elliptical galaxies, but we also have galaxies that have been around for a long period of time, including the Andromeda galaxy, um, which seem to have arms longer than they should have. So the proposal has been made that there is some kind of dark matter, maybe neutrinos, maybe brown dwarfs, maybe who knows what, that somehow has gravitational force that's scattered throughout the galaxy so that the inner parts don't spin all that fast and the outer parts spin faster so that the spiral arms are not erased. Then galaxies, the closest ones, seem to be accelerating away from us a little faster than we would expect. And this is a proposed to be due to some kind of energy that we don't know what it is. And so it's called dark energy. We can't see it. Hugely ad hoc. Why should that happen? In fact, if you read the standard presentations, it, they will say that we see approximately 5 to 10 percent of the universe. All of the rest is invisible. Now, this could also be taken in interesting directions. Maybe that 5 percent occasionally can interact with matter, and maybe it's made up of things like angels. Again, I don't think that's where they want to go. But there's no particular reason to rule out another whole universe that, that runs the, that, uh, that can interact with us, that can produce what we would now, nowadays call miracles. This is a kind of a standard uh, that I got from Wikimedia. And you'll notice that at first it inflates at a huge rate, and then for some reason it stops, kind of slows down, and then expands at a more or less parabolic arc until now we get to the present when it starts to re-expand more, and that's the dark energy. Most of you thought that it was more like a cone that gradually came out. But that's not the standard theory. Now, it's interesting that they've got this down to 13.79 plus, or 8, 7, 8 plus or minus 0 0.1 or something like that billion years. Um, but, you know, if you were to project this backwards, it, it would actually come out to about there. So, you know, the cone actually is, what, a 20 billion year uh, projection instead of the instead of the 13.7 that they're talking about, and there are reasons for that. There are stars that look like they're too old if we don't have the rapid expansion, and then the galaxies um, coming together shortly afterwards. Some of those stars look like they go back to to. 8 billion years old or something like that, and, and uh, that means that you, can, you, can't, you can't have an 8 billion year old universe with 8 billion year old stars. It just won't work. Um, beyond the Big Bang itself is that there are parts of it that are fine-tuning, uh, that are fine-tuned, and I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. Uh, one of them is the expansion rate now has to be accurate to within one part in 10 to the 60. To give you an idea of how accurate that is, that means that uh, it's the equivalent of doing a hole-in-one 
across the size of the universe. That's a pretty, pretty um, a stiff requirement. If it's larger, the universe would have collapsed too early. If it's smaller, the universe would go on expanding forever without ever producing galaxies. There's another example, and there, there are many uh, more of these. And some of them are related to each other and some of them are not. Uh, but these two are not related to each other directly, is the carbon and oxygen resonances that carbon formation is favored uh, when three helium nuclei come together because of a nuclear resonance that Hoyle predicted would be there because it had to. And that oxygen has a resonance that is off just enough so that all the carbon doesn't turn into oxygen. And as Fred Hoyle said in 1981, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics, as well as with chemistry and biology, and there are, that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seems to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Now, Hoyle is not a Catholic priest. He is, in fact, or was, an anti-theist. He was the, one of the prime movers behind the steady state theory, trying desperately to get God out of uh, cosmology. He felt he didn't have any choice. Now, it's certainly arguable that the Big Bang is, in one sense, theist friendly. But now we come to another question. It's also arguable that certain aspects of the Big Bang are ad hoc. And so I don't think that it's fair for us to simply say, well, the Big Bang must be true. And uh, inflation, dark matter, and dark energy we've mentioned uh, as the most prominent of those. And the most popular interpretation of Genesis seems to indicate a universe of age around 6,000 years. I mean, maybe it's 7,500, but it's, you know, it's certainly less than 20,000 years and probably less than 10,000 years. Now, what do we do with trying to make uh, those two fit? Well... There are three sets of approaches. Number one is that the traditional interpretation of the Bible, that is to say God created the universe in 6,000 years, is right. And science, I am using science in the sense of the current scientific consensus, not in terms of what science really is, is right about appearances but not about the actual facts. In other words, if you look at the universe and you don't take the Bible into consideration, you would think the universe is old. Um, but once you have the Bible, you know that the real truth is the universe isn't as old as it looks. Now, some of that's not unreasonable. For example, if you were to come up in the Garden of Eden and you were to look at Adam, you would say uh, maybe he's 20 years old. I mean, he's full grown, doesn't have, you know, the epiphyses are closed. Um, maybe you'd say he was 60 years old back then, but you'd say he's certainly old enough. He was mature. But, um, but of course, if you drew that conclusion, you would be wrong because you'd see him on Sunday and he was exactly two days old. Same way with Eve. Same way with the Garden of Eden, which looked like it had been growing there for who knows how long. But God planted that and made it grow enough to where when Adam was ready, he could eat fruit right from the trees. So it's not totally ridiculous to, to go that way. But it does 
kind of leave a little bit of a bad taste in the mouth. What it sounds like is that science, when honestly looked at, points away from the biblical record. Now, we've seen some other places where science does, in fact, when correctly looked at, at least in my opinion, point towards the biblical record. So um, I'm not totally comfortable with that theory. The second uh, way, uh, way of approaching is that the traditional interpretation of the Bible is right and the current scientific consensus just missed something. That if you apply science properly, you'd realize that it leaned in the, in the direction of the traditional interpretation. And the third one is that the traditional interpretation itself is not quite accurate. That either the Bible isn't accurate, which of course is the easy way out, or that the, that the Bible is mostly accurate, but we've been misinterpreting a few terms, uh, or perhaps, uh, perhaps there's one or two pieces of a verse that, that uh, don't convey all of the uh, proper nuances of the situation. So we're going to, I'm going to ignore option one now, and we're going to go with option two. Traditional interpretation of the Bible is yes, and science is no, and science somehow missed something. Now, the problem that you have to deal with in that case is very simple. When we look into space, we're also looking into time. If some star is a light year away, it means that at the present speed of light, it took one year to get from that star to here. Well, what that means is that the universe can't be more than 10,000 light years across. 6,000, 8,000, whatever. Well, you know, where does that leave the Andromeda galaxy, which is supposed to be a million light years away? Well, some people have proposed that, well, it's really not a galaxy, it's just a nebula with this big star in the center, but then every once in a while there's an exploding star in it. Well, the exploding star is behind it. Well, it's a nice theory, but the problem that you have with that kind of theory is that you can explain away the nebula that way, but you can't explain away the exploding star. The universe, frankly, appears bigger than 10,000 light years. So now what are we going to do? Well, one idea is that light traveled faster in the past. And that's probably most closely associated with Barry Sitterfield and there's uh, his website. The problem that I have with that theory is not so much that it couldn't possibly happen as that it doesn't make any new predictions. It will tell you what light, how fast light should have traveled, let's say, at the time of Jesus. But what it won't do is tell you that in the future, when we measure light, it will be even slower. Because the theory requires that light comes down to an asymptote. And so it makes the theory basically uh, untestable. Now, eventually I hope that it does become testable. And if it does, it will be very interesting to test it against the standard theory. And then we will be entering into science. As it is, it's almost a more of a historical explanation. Doesn't make it wrong, but it does kind of take it out of the realm of science. The, the other one is the time on Earth was relativistically slowed. So that the seven days on Earth were actually uh, 4.5 billion years in terms of the solar system and 13.7 uh, uh, billion years in terms of the rest of the universe. This is most closely some, uh, associated with um, uh, Russell Humphrey's uh, 1994 book, Starlight and Time, which he's revised. Um, and the problem that I have there is that the plants are created on the third day, which means that the Earth must have been somewhat stable during that time period. But, uh, I mean, the, 
the surface of the earth I don't have a problem with. Okay, so now we'll start manufacturing uh, everything out of water, by the way, which is fine. Uh, but plants are kind of delicate, and yet somehow the sun is made on the fourth day. Um, that's one problem with the consist internal consistency of the theory itself. The other problem is uh, very similar to that of uh, Barry Sutterfield, that the predictions match almost perfectly those of the Big Bang cosmology anyway. And so there's no particular reason to believe um, Russell Humphreys against the Big Bang cosmology except that it somehow makes uh, uh, scripture more consistent. Well, I mean, that's a positive, so I won't say it, it's nothing. But it would, for the purposes of science, it'd sure be nice if he made some predictions that we could specifically draw on. Um, there's a model that's put out by Robert Gentry, and there's the website again. And for those of you who aren't taking notes right now, uh, uh, you can uh, look it up in the uh, either in the email that was sent or in the uh, uh, video that we'll have up later on. But that model challenges the Copernican principle, which is fine with me. I think that putting us at the near the center of the universe isn't that bad. Putting the throne of God at the center of the universe might be, you know, actually a reasonable thing to do. Um, and it challenges the Big Bang Theory and asks some very embarrassing questions, one of which has been alluded to here bef uh, earlier. Um, why do galaxy clusters not expand, uh, expand but not galaxies? The whole galaxies tend to hold together, not just the Earth-Mars distance or the Earth-Sun distance, but uh, uh, the expansion actually... Uh, uh, you know, keeps the sun in, in, in our galaxy in relative this, relatively the same size. It would seem like if you're going to expand space, you'd expand space everywhere and not just around galaxies, but also in them. And another question is, what happens to this light? It loses energy as its wavelength increases. Its energy decreases. Where does that energy go? Are we violating the law of conservation of energy? And the, uh, a, a, another challenge, and I wouldn't say this is exhaustive, is why are quasars quantized in redshift? That is, to, they have a group of redshifts that are fairly close to each other, and then another group that's fairly close to each other, and then another group that's fairly close to each other, rather than being relatively smoothly distributed. Is something going on here that we don't understand? Probably yes. Um, but as I read the model and tried to understand it, it doesn't look like it, it answers the problem posed by the speed of light. So we're going to be still stuck even if you accept a gentry cosmology. And the same thing, by the way, is true for uh, some of the other cosmologies that have been floated, like plasma cosmologies. Um, maybe it's 180 million years ago, maybe it's 180,000 years ago, but in any case it looks like there is something before creation week. Now of course Adventists are kind of not too unhappy with that because with a great controversy you want to have God and the devil arguing and they exist in some kind of space um, before the creation of the world. Now, okay, well, maybe we should just simply accept that science at least is partly correct and that there was time before creation. So the traditional interpretation of the Bible, that is to say um, uh, that, that the entire universe was created in uh, 6,000 years or 8,000 or whatever, uh, is just wrong. Well, one way of doing it, of course, is to totally scrap the Genesis story. It, that has, is problematic on multiple levels, and I'm not going to go into that at this time. Um, 
There is the idea of Gorman Gray and Bernard Taylor, who presented here earlier, uh, a few years ago, some of you may remember, where the Genesis story really begins in Genesis 1-3. And there's actually some defense of that on the basis of the Hebrew grammar. If you, uh, if you look at verse 2, it's, and the earth was without form and void, and so forth. Uh, whereas verse 3 and onward has the standard Hebrew consecutive, vav consecutive con construction. And he said God. That is, the and is put on the verb, which is put first. That's the way normally Hebrew does its narrative. And so this is more properly translated, and in some of your translations you'll see this. Now the earth was. So you have, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without form and void, and darkness on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And so you have this just before God gets ready to say, let there be light, and there was light, that there's something there. And maybe it wasn't created that same day. And maybe, in fact, you could even argue that if you have a dark earth, days don't matter. Because there are no days. So maybe the, the uh, material of the earth preceded creation week. Or maybe at least the material of the universe this may be the story of the heavens and the earth, meaning the solar system. Now, there's another uh, way of looking at things that was championed uh, by Robert Brown, who's now deceased. And he said that heaven, or Hashemayim, and earth, Haaretz, are defined in the text. That is, and God called the dry land earth. So when he talks about these heavens and the earth, he's not talking about everything, which is a traditional interpretation. He is just talking about the dry land and what's in it. And, of course, the Exodus commandment goes on to say heaven, the earth, and the sea. So the sea and all that in them were created at that time. Um, but the heaven is talking specifically about the atmosphere of the earth. Now, the problem that I have with that, and it's a minor one and can be gotten around if you want to, is that the sun and the moon were placed in the firmament of the heavens, the Rakia Hashemayim. And so if the firmament includes where the sun and the moon are, then it's a little harder to say that the sun and the moon weren't created on the fourth day. Could be. Although to be technical, if you read it, it doesn't say the sun. It says the greater light and the lesser light. Now that's always been assumed to be a polemic against worshiping the suns. You see, we don't even mention the sun. It's not worth, uh, worth, worth uh, talking about. But on the other hand, perhaps what God is saying is that was when the light could be seen from the earth that uh, became the sun. So maybe we're talking about a clearing of the atmosphere. Could happen. Um, I tend to see that what God is actually saying is uh, that he don't need no stinking sun that he creates light and it's there. And then he creates the sun in the fourth day specifically to show that the sun isn't as important as everybody thinks. And there is some support of that in Revelation where there will be no sun because the God and the Lamb are the light of the new Jerusalem. Um, 
Now, finally, there's, uh, well, actually, there's two proposals about the, and the stars. Or if you're reading the King James, he made the stars also. You'll notice that he made is in, uh, uh, is in italics. They supplied that. There is an argument that is made, and I should have had the reference to it, but uh, can be found, um, that and the stars should actually be translated with the stars. <coughs> The Hebrew vowel pointing suggests that possibility. If you look at it very carefully, this is et hakokavim, and you'll see that there are two dots here, which means it's actually what eight instead of what et, which is a triple dot um, with a, the third dot being under the first two. Don't worry about that slash. It, it, that's a, an accent mark. Um, and if that's the case, then what was really intended to be said is God made the greater light to rule the day, and he made the lesser light to rule the night with the stars. And that it's not specifically referring to the stars. And so perhaps that's what we're looking at. Now, I'm not totally comfortable with that suggestion because it seemed like uh, in English you would say with the stars instead of and with the stars but you can point to some Hebrew parallelism and so I'm not going to say that it's wrong and there's one other proposal and that is and the stars was added later that this the original text was given by God and at one time the stars were not visible before the flood. And so God didn't bother mentioning them. But Moses or perhaps Abraham or perhaps, um, perhaps Noah. When uh, the story is retold, somewhere along the line somebody says, oh yeah, and the stars were uh, included also. Uh, that God created everything, and he just wanted to be complete. And it's technically inaccurate, but the spirit is correct. That is to say that God did create the stars as well as the sun, moon, and the earth. And, of course, if you want to restrict the stars in this case to the uh, planets, without the sun, they wouldn't light up. So perhaps that's what we're looking at. Now, there are hints of an older universe, and perhaps the most obvious hint is in Job 38 when Job said, the Lord answers Job. Out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? And uh, goes on, and he's going to ask Job a bunch of questions. And then he asks, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who laid the measures thereof, if you know, or who had stretched the line upon it, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Lay foundations, cornerstone, this is laid when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, which implies some kind of a universe looking on as the earth is created. And that implies that perhaps the beginning is more of the earth than, than, of, than of us, uh, than of the universe. Because there is some universe. Now, what do people who uh, want to maintain that our entire universe was created at the time say? Well, they say that that was another universe. Okay. Now, my own take is, frankly, I don't know. There are a couple of decades ago, I would have opted for a young life, old universe, and taken full advantage of Big Bang cosmology and said, see, Big Bang gives evidence of God's uh, uh, running the universe. I am no longer as sure. I have moved from young life on Earth to young Earth creationism. 
although I'm still not a young universe, I'm an old universe creationist. But you know, a young universe creationism is in some ways theologically attractive, although I still have a problem with Job and uh, I do have a problem with Ellen White if you go that way. Um, although you could always put angels in an entirely separate universe or perhaps part of dark matter. Um, there is biblical counter evidence for young earth creationism. So the, the Job passage, I think, argues pretty strongly that something was there, wherever it was. I don't think we have to have all the answers. And uh, frankly, I can live without knowing. Someday, we'll all know. Of course, by then it'll be too late to use it in uh, the ways that we want to use it now. I, I think one thing, we, need, we all need to be careful about criticizing each other. I would rather say there are problems in your way of looking at things rather than to say you are wrong. Because I think that uh, we can get into trouble that way. And I think we even need to be even more careful about criticizing the Bible. And for that reason, I'm not totally comfortable with saying, well, this one little passage or this one, these two words were added later on. Um, but I'm not prepared to say it couldn't possibly be true. Uh, but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, we have a mic. Uh, can we pass it back? I'm not By sure way, I'm using is, the before word. You get, before you get started, I should point out it is now 11.30, and I know some of you have to be elsewhere. So I'm not sure I'm using the word paranormal correctly, but you recall, um, was it Elijah or Isaiah? Elijah, wasn't it, that was surrounded by the enemy? And his servant said, alas, master, what will we do? And his response was, um, there are things, and there's some difficulty in the Hebrew here, invisible or unseen. But in any case, he was able to reveal to the young man that they were surrounded by angels that certainly had been unseen up to that point. So there can be a, uh, an element here that's, not normal, but very realistic in that we can't see them. You know, Ellen White says there are angels here in this room, uh, evil and good apparently. <laughs> we can't see them, can't touch them suddenly, and yet if we believe then they, uh, they do exist in our present. I would agree with that, and uh, um, I don't see, uh, that's one of the reasons why I think we need to be very careful about criticizing each other as being wrong, because what we see is not necessarily what we get. You know, it, it, Elisha's prayer is very interesting. Lord, open this man's eyes so he can see. And once his eyes were opened, he could see that uh, those that are with us are far more than those that are against us. And it's interesting that the chariots didn't fight each other. That what God actually did was wind up smiting the uh, uh, enemy host with blindness. Yes, and then we'll pass it down here. Paul, you're asking some of the, the biggest questions uh, challenging human understanding. Uh, the one that you didn't raise today was, should we assume that creation was a fiat advent event? that God just said, let there be light, and it was light. Or, when we look at the universe, when we look at the, the star, the, the stars, when we look at the moon, 
with clear impact craters. There have been processes at work that formed these celestial bodies. And it all happened within, within time. I guess what I'm raising here is whether uh, creation occurred just as we have widely said as a let there be light, let there be something, let there be Adam. A fiat creation. Well, to be technical, in the case of Adam, there was actually a process. Yes. But you see, even in that process where God took the dust of the earth and created Adam, he still was using material which had come into being, its atoms and molecules, on the basis of physical laws which bound together the atomic structures which have, scientists have been arguing about for a hundred years. And is it possible then that the original fiat creation was to create the laws of physics which then led to chemistry? And we can start at that original point and create the dust of the earth which God used as a process. So. I, I find this is a very fundamental question. Uh, should, we, should we lean on a fiat creation or on a process creation, uh, assuming that the, the process that we can observe had its beginnings with the laws of, nat of the nature which we can analyze and, <laughs> and observe in action. Uh, well, if you're going to be reasonable, I think you're stuck with a fiat creation regardless of which way you go. And I, I think point, that that's, yes. an that's an important point, that, I that even, if, even if you take the rest of the universe and project it backwards, that you wind up with a, a universe that comes out of nothing, literally nothing, not even just empty space, but nothing. There's no space, there's no time, there's no nothing. And, uh, pardon the double negative. <laughs> and, and, and then God, you know, one of the things that has elided just kind of passed over is how you get galaxies and how you get stars to come together. And I, I know it's always, well, because, but most stars are made of hydrogen, which is, you know, uh, either atomic or molecular. In either case, the lightest element known, why it should con congregate into large uh, collections is not clear. Um, uh, you know, it's obvious that there has been there has been process at work in the universe. Uh, yeah, no, but yes. but um, I mean, for example, the moon. Uh, you could say, well, is you know, has it been there for four billion years or whatever, or has it been there for six thousand years? And at creation, there was a lot of meteorite impact, and at the flood, there was a lot of meteorite impact. Certainly, there, if if you if you take the standard model for the flood. There's a lot of meteorite impact. The, everybody knows about Chalixicab and you know, the Yucatan. But there's Chesapeake Bay that's in the middle of the Paleozoic. There's uh, one up in Canada. Uh, and we're talking about huge impacts, not just little ones. And there's probably a lot of other little ones that didn't, didn't even count. And now that we have very beautiful close-up photographs of Mars and its surface, we've got physical features on the surface of Mars that demand a physical explanation. There was a process at work there. And, but and could that you say, demands a history of the, of the solar yeah. system. That but could you say that that history is uh, 4.5 billion rather than 6,000 years? No. It, well, the, the people who promote the electric universe, of course, invoke huge physical forces which classic astronomy is ignoring namely the electrical forces in the universe. 
Uh, that's another long story. But. Yeah. Mm. The, prob the problem, again, is it's hard to make the entire universe into 6,000 years uh, without invoking the Omphalos uh, explanation. It just looks old. Um, it's not totally impossible, but it's really hard. Uh, and I don't think we have all of the answers yet. And I think if I was saying anything to people who are trying to compact everything into 6,000 years, or uh, again, less than 10,000 years, that would be the first thing. The first thing I would point out is that you have a problem. And I don't think that that should be, even if one believes that our evangelistic thrust, Because I don't think it's a I don't think it's a good sale. Um, I, I think that the problems are too great to to just simply go that way, um, and that's uh, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm personally not a young universe creationist, even though. Uh, even though I recognize that they may wind up being right. We'll, we'll have to find out in the New Earth. I think it would be well to say here that, that Seventh-day Adventists are at variance from the principal community of creationists worldwide. Yes, and some people will say that we're not really creationists because we don't include the whole universe. That's right. And, and they, these, some of these men are my very good close friends. And they complain that, yes, Adventists are strong on supporting the scriptures and their authority, but, uh, but we don't believe literally the six-day creation of the universe. I might add, if I may, one more thing, that the whole of Islam and the Quran uh, accepts a creator, God, who... Uh, who was a fiat creationist. He just said, be. He didn't have to stop and take time to design the whole thing. Islam resists uh, intelligent design, which suggests that it took time to put the whole plan together. Hmm. The Quran just says, Allah didn't design or anything. He just said, be, and there it was, fiat. Yeah, technically it'll go down here first, and then we'll hand it back up. And uh, if we want to hand the mic behind. Um, the thing that I find a little bit uh, interesting is that uh, when we try to explain the complexity of our universe, we invoke uh, multiverse theory uh, as a way of explaining the existence of our universe by random chance. And the problem with that is that if there, if there is difficulty explaining the complexity of our universe, does invoking a multiverse system make the situation more or less complex? Well, you could always ask, which is simpler? Many universes are one God. Yeah, you could say that, <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is you're not only putting off the explanation, you're actually making what is supposed to be an explanation into a much bigger problem. And, and I was surprised to see that some <laughs> theists also invoke uh, another universe to explain Job, uh, in order to avoid uh, old universe, uh, our, I should say the old age of our universe, in which case we're back to the same problem. Uh, I'm not to be sure. fair to them, they're they're explicitly doing metaphysics. Well, yeah, yeah, agreed, agreed. They never pr presume to say that they have a scientific explanation for it. Yeah. So, so in that sense. Uh, um, I, I see that both of these have the same problem, that we're trying to explain a problem 
by invoking a much bigger problem. <laughs> I, I would agree. And, and that's, that, and that that's one of the theological reasons why, I, uh, why I'm not a young universe creationist at this yeah, point. And that, in my view, is not making progress. That is actually stepping back, not, not forward. And after that, go ahead. Uh, many things uh, could discuss here, but um, I, uh, I'll just mention first uh, Psalms 24 2, Psalms 136 6 uh, suggests uh, a wet earth here before the creation of land, the continents where. Uh, uh, at that time, it looks like, and Second Peter three, of course, uh, suggests that you know the earth was created out of water, and Genesis one, so on. So th there's that aspect, and uh, and some say, of course, that the Ten Commandments say that God created the seas on the, uh, in six days, because it states that. And, but others say, well, no, the third day of creation takes that. It's, it was part of the creation week process to create land. Uh, well, certainly in the in the in the record it says, and the waters gathering the waters together, he called seas. Yeah. And so, uh, um, uh, I think uh, that it's the same Hebrew word so for the sea uh, in both Exodus in twenty the eleven. Uh, the heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and the sea in uh, in Genesis one. So uh, yeah, but even if you take fair. Genesis one without putting uh, any kind of mm -hmm. uh, backstory behind it, you still have the uh, you still have the creation of the seas in, within creation week, and that's uh, the the Psalm twenty four. Um, which two? That's thirty-one. Um, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. So, sounds, um, like, sounds, sounds like there was water there first, like uh, yeah. Genesis but see, the, the original you know. story you'll remember is, you know, in, in the beginning God created. Now right. the earth was without. It fits. It fits. Uh, exactly and so, that. if you make the the beginning. Just before day one, it, uh, or perhaps at the beginning of day one, uh, you'd still have water there because the text mm -hmm. says, you know, there was water. Sure. The, the question is, was there water for days, years, we, you know, millennia, uh, billions of years, or not? Yeah, why well, mention it if it was just part of the account of the account so many times in the Bible? It, uh, but. Uh, I want to get back to uh, the deeper question uh, that uh, Dr. Brandstater has been raising here and so on a little bit. Uh, there's a basic question, you know, why is there anything instead of nothing? Uh, when we pursue our cause and effect science, we run into that question. Why is there anything instead of nothing? Yet we all seem to agree there is something. Uh, and uh, this uh, puts us into a mode where we're not completely cause and effect uh, when we say, well, God did it or something like this, or where did God come from, and all, you know, all these deep questions we like to ask. Uh, Seems to me we are we are pushed at times into that realm. I, I have you know I fall back on quantum mechanics, as, you know, uh, just as a, as a way of you know, hey, th there's mysteries out there we don't understand. Is it that we don't understand enough, or is it that our cause and effect is too simplistic? Somewhere or perhaps it isn't too simplistic, and the and the first cause before the universe started was in fact God. But then you know you raise well, where did God come from? And, well, uh, and so on. Uh, there, so, there uh, has in fact I've seen it argued uh, philosophically, uh, just with some success, that <laughs> um, that if you follow the chain of cause back far enough, 
you, you either have an infinite regress or you have a first cause. Well, and infinite regress mm -hmm. is not really satisfactory, and that leaves you with a first cause. Well, but this this is uh, you you have you have uh, dropped normal rationality in doing that. Uh, the point I'm trying to say here is that uh, you take the miracles in the Bible uh, and so on. At times we are forced into suggesting, hey, there is something beyond our normal understanding of cause and effect. Uh, whether it be how come there's anything instead of nothing or so on. Uh, and to me the question is at what level are you going to draw the line for a miracle. Now, people say, well, if God does it, it's not a miracle. He always works by his laws. If it's a miracle, it's, it's through his laws. Uh, depends on how you define miracle. Uh, still, uh, we're faced with those issues that uh, there's something beyond normal cause and effect. Now, if we go too far along the line of Accepting irrationality, of course, we lose reason, we lose rationality, we, the universe no longer makes sense. Uh, and my, my, uh, my only suggestion is reality is more complex than the simple rules we like to put there, and, and we probably have both involved in here, both rationality and, and irrationality, uh, but we're more comfortable with reducing the irrationality as much as we can and we have to live with that and uh, you know some creationists of course are very subjective and uh, any problem well God did it uh, and uh, case closed uh, somewhere there we we, we, uh, we need to realize uh, I think that Reality is more complex than just simple rules of cause and effect or simple f blind faith of miracles. Uh, we know that reality works because it, it's all about us. Well, I think if there's any lesson from that, it is simply that we need to be humble about our ability to pin down the truth. And that means we need to be humble about our ability to to make other people pin down the truth as well. We have a question. A couple days ago on a post called uh, nextbigfuture.com, um, there's this post, I'll, I'll read it, I'll read three of the paragraphs. It says, problem with the Big Bang expanding universe theory. In a startling challenge to the widely popular Big Bang theory, new evidence to be published this week in the International Journal of Modern Physics uh, indicates that the universe is not expanding after all. The evidence based on detailed measurements of the size and brightness of hundreds of galaxies adds to a growing list of observations that contradict the predictions of the increasingly complex Big Bang model. The new research tested one of the striking predictions of the Big Bang theory, that ordinary geometry does not work at great distances. In the space around us on Earth in the solar system and the Milky Way, as similar objects get farther away, they look fainter and smaller. Their surface brightness, that is, the brightness per unit area, remains constant. In contrast, the Big Bang theory tells us that in an expanding universe, objects actually should appear fainter but bigger. Thus, in this theory, the surface brightness decreases with the distance. In addition, the light is stretched as the universe expanded, further dimming the light. So, in an expanding universe, the most distant galaxies should have hundreds of times dimmer surface brightness than similar nearby galaxies, making them actually undetectable with modern day d telescopes. Um, and then the researchers carefully compared the size and brightness of about a thousand nearby and extremely distant galaxies. You, um, I'll stop there, but any, uh, any comment on, on this? Well, I think it's fair to say this is another challenge to uh, Big Bang cosmology as being the absolute final. Um, and I think that if there's one thing that we should learn from 
the history of science it is that we should not hitch our theology irrevocably to any particular scientific theory because uh, when the theory changes, suddenly uh, uh, our little engine has disappeared. Uh, and, you know, it's tempting to go on the bandwagon, uh, but it may turn out that the Big Bang actually mm -hmm. doesn't hold as much water as has been previously thought. Uh, certainly, uh, Robert Gentry has some cogent criticisms um, and it may be that another theory that, in fact, I'm, I'm rather suspicious that the Copernican principle is really an anti-theist principle and may turn out to be just fundamentally wrong. In which case, theories that, uh, that use it heavily uh, uh, may have some major defects. And that may be true even for theories that are not completely dependent on it, but are partially dependent on it. The Big Bang is one of those theories. It doesn't say that every time is the same, but it does say that everywhere in space, the universe should look relatively uh, even. And that may not be fair. There are some pretty decent arguments for a center to the universe being close to us. Um, are you referring to Gentry's? Because um, my, my understanding, I don't I, think you really I'm referring to his it. arguments, not so much to the theory itself. Um, the theory is an attempt to make the arguments coherent. Uh, but I've seen other arguments of the same kind that, that apparently uh, collections of galaxies and quasars are oriented in such a way that, the, uh, uh, that they appear to be pointing towards us, which is an unusual um, uh, phenomenon if we're just randomly oriented in the universe. That there should be some pointing sideways and point, some pointing away from us and so forth. I understand that Gentry um, says that the, red, the apparent redshift comes about, that, well the actual redshift comes about from uh, when the light is emitted that uh, as it travels, light travels down a potential energy well. Uh, and if we're close to the center of the universe, then we'd be near this, the bottom of that energy well. That, uh, that stretches the wavelength and you, and you get a, a redshift. Is that correct? I'm not sure that I can explain his particular explanation of the, of the redshift. Okay. Uh, to me, uh, if, you, if you follow if you follow Einstein, uh, which Gentry may disagree with, I don't know, uh, it would seem that if you're at the bottom of an energy well, the incoming light actually picks up energy and therefore increases its frequency. Um, but but um, space is stretched in, a, in an energy well, correct? That is what gravity is, is stretched space, is that correct? Well, sort of, but it, you see, then, then he has the same problem as the, as the other people who are, you know, losing energy of, of light as space is stretched. Where does the energy go? Uh, if you're coming down an energy well, then either the, uh, either, the, either the speed has to go up in order to keep the energy constant or are they in, in order to allow for more energy being input as you're going down the energy well, or, uh, or else the frequency has to go up, one of the two. And to say that the further out you go, the slower the speed of light, that actually is more difficult to explain in terms of getting everything done in 6,000 years. It's a complex subject. We have a comment over here. Or did you want another one? Well, we raised many questions here. And uh, of course, what we do with the, with the Big Bang is a whole of huge subject. And uh, I think we ought to mention here before we depart 
that there is a competing theory that dismisses the hot Big Bang, which had its beginnings with, uh, as you know, with Hubble, Lemaitre and Friedman mm -hmm. and so on. Um, the competing theory is the cold Big Bang. And that's a very different, a different scenario altogether, which we have not heard about, at least in, uh, in Adventist circles. And yet it has had a very significant following for many decades. In fact, in the 1920s, George Lemaitre himself, the, Be the Belgian Jesuit priest, a great cosmologist and scholar, he and was... And also a, a bigwig in the, uh, in the uh, Pontifican... Uh, uh, I've forgotten what he is. He's head of the, uh, oh. the science department there, he something was a, like that. A much revered physicist. Anyway, he was he laid out the the framework for a cold Big Bang, which had a very different beginning than the singularity, which everybody is bothered by, and the cold Big Bang actually uh, starts as I heard it described a year ago in Albuquerque, it starts with what is called the, the Bose-Einstein condensate. That's a long story and I won't, I don't know anything about it. But um, the interesting thing is that the cold Big Bang has had supporters including no less than, than uh, Dr. Teller, who was the father of the hydrogen bomb, uh, and uh, his colleague Maria Mayer, and others more recently in the 1990s, a man called Kurt Aguirre uh, published a series of articles on the cold Big Bang as a preferable story of the cosmic origin. Now, I can't go into more detail here, and I, I need to check out the origin, the sources, but the nice thing about the cold Big Bang is that when it's done, it ends up with all the molecule, all the atoms in the periodic table and at a temperature which is friendly to life. And that's what the hot Big Bang does not do. Anyway, just wanted to let people here know that there mm -hmm. are competing theories that, that are not uh, accepting the hot Big Bang scenario. Just a word about heavens and earth. Maybe my thinking is rather simplistic, but when I read uh, those phrases, I notice in the Bible there's a technical theological word, term for they go, as a pair. Mm -hmm. Goes in a pair. Heavens and the earth. Yes. And it, it means the it means the highest heaven, the lowest earth, and everything in between. That's um, uh, well, I'm trying to think. And I is this or something yeah. like that. Something that, like that. that basically uh, it's using it's the parts for the whole. It's, it's very much like from Dan to Beersheba. And yeah, they meant yeah. the entire bit of uh, the entire nation of Israel. And well, some places I read it like I, th I think of Peter, and uh, I believe it's in Revelation too, about the heavens and the earth, God will create a new heavens and a new earth and I'm thinking I don't understand these people that think the whole what do they do with this I think that the universe the whole universe is going to be recreated why where is sin contaminating the entire universe that just does not make sense to me well so I to the, me it's the, the, the people I don't know how they can say that we are yeah we're off and we don't believe the Bible because the Bible does not prove that the whole universe, to me, as I read it, was created in 6,000 years. <laughs> well, uh, people who do this will, will claim that the universe that we have here oh. uh, is uninhabited except for us. And for them, if we were to get an ET message, it would destroy their faith. It, it'd be hard on my faith, too, frankly, because I can't imagine that anybody who looks at our television programs would want to wire us back. <laughs> you, you, you can know it's the devil or something <laughs> if you get E.T. <laughs> it, it struck me what Sister was raising is a very important point because 
if all the other intelligent beings are in some other universe, what that really means is not only that our planet has fallen, but that our entire universe has fallen, essentially. That's it. Uh, well, that's correct. Um, if you interpreted it that way, then, then that, is, that is a problem. And uh, uh, like I say, the, the solution to that is to say the, uni the universe that we see is uninhabited except for us. And if there are other inhabitants of other things, they're in a totally separate universe. So it looks like if you're going to go that route, you're kind of stuck with a multiverse, uh, at least a diverse. And there's no biblical support for that either. So I don't think they should condemn us. Well, here's the, here's the thing. I'm not willing to condemn them. I am not um, either. I am willing to say I have problems with their theory and this or some of them, but that's a whole different question. Well, I was talking um, about them condemning us. Well, that's true. Or, or reprimanding or getting after us. The, uh, and, and uh, of course, we don't totally have control over who condemns who no. except for no. ourselves. And, you know, we can advocate for being... Uh, you know, I don't uh, have any, feel any animosity. Charitable. Uh, the fact of the matter is nobody knows for sure, and I think that uh, one of the things we need to be careful of is... I'm more <laughs> sympathetic with them by far <laughs> be, as being most honest than a lot of these other you know, long-age theory yeah. types. But the other thing that I will say mm -hmm. is this, that I have talked to some of these people and although they have to maintain that they think I'm wrong on the age of the universe, most of them are not trying to kick me out of the Christian community. And I think that that is, I think that things are getting better in that regard. I, you know, we, uh, after this last time we, uh, Dr. Baumgartner had a long chat with several of our people uh, I didn't get the feeling that he was thinking, well, you know, they're nice people, but they've got this idea, and so they just, we have to consign them to the flames. Uh, it's, it's not that way. He seems too nice a person to do that, to well, think that. It, it, I think one of the things that we need to do is to get to know each other, and I think that goes a long ways towards taking the horns off of other people. And for that matter, taking our horns off of us in regard with regard to those other people. Anyway, uh, next week we will try to make it much shorter. This was far longer than I wanted it to be, but uh, uh, hopefully um, we'll have less material to go through and less controversial material.